How will Whole Foods, the grocery chain that revolutionized our expectations of supermarkets, be affected by its recent merger with Amazon, the online retail giant? Can conscious capitalism, the high-minded philosophy of Whole Foods co-founder and CEO John Mackey, survive a partnership with a company known for its relentless pursuit of cost savings and growth? That's what was on our mind most when Reason sat down with Mackey at LibertyCon, the annual meeting of Students for Liberty. In a wide-ranging conversation, Mackey talks candidly about the Amazon merger and the stockholder activism that drove him to seek the deal in the first place how his ethical veganism and hardcore libertarianism inform one another, and why he's optimistic about both the future of commerce and the idealism of young Americans. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and we are sitting down with the co-founder and CEO of Whole Foods, John Mackey, a great friend to Liberty and to Students for Liberty. We're filming this at the Students for Liberty's LibertyCon 2018. John, thanks for talking. Thanks for having me on, Nick. Good to see you. Are you optimistic about young people um, in general, or is it that there's a, a certain percentage? Because it seems when, when you listen to young people talk or the way that they vote, et cetera, there's a certain amount of kind of libertarian brio there, which is like we like capitalism or we like freedom because it allows us to express our purpose in peaceful ways. But then there is a really resurgent or insurgent group of young people on college campuses and elsewhere who are kind of in a Bernie Sanders camp. Yeah. Um, you know, how, how do you think that plays well, out? Well, I think it's a good question. And I think there's two trends that are going on. Uh, I definitely think there's a... Uh, young people are idealistic. It's, you know, the old saying that if you're not a socialist when you're 21, you've got no heart. And if you're not a capitalist by the time you're 30, you have no brains. And I still think that plays out. It's young people, are, they come of age, they look around, they take for granted the prosperity, they take for granted the ethical, moral progress the humanity's made. And they look around and they say, by God, it's not perfect. There is still racism, there's still poverty, there's still inequality, the whole thing's unfair. And there, so they are susceptible to the siren call of any type of utopian answer that promises to fix it and make things better. Um, but because they're not very experienced and they don't know, know history very well, and they don't understand how the bad get on top, as Hayek said, that that utopian impulse uh, of perfectionism is usually the enemy of the good. So uh, usually they grow out of that. So I, I'm not going to be too disturbed when I hear utopian young people because I was one. And I grew out of it, and you probably won, yeah. and you're probably going to grow out of it someday. <laughs> <laughs> I'll grow out of this mustache first, but no, no. In all seriousness, uh, and then, but I also think people are these young people. When I compare myself at the same age, uh, you know, if I go back a long time ago, forty plus years, in a lot of ways, they're more conscious and more awake than my generation was at the same period of time. So I think there's reason for optimism, but of course. Yeah, you know, I've seen the polls too, and yeah. and and fifty one percent said they think socialism is better than capitalism. That is a very disturbing statistic. Although I tend to be somewhat skeptical of pretty much anything I read in the paper because or the news because they, they so much hunger for sensationalism mm -hmm. and headlines and clickbait and things like that. And plus, so many I get so many lies told about me. It's hard for me to believe anything I read. So, well, this seems like a good uh, point to uh, talk about the merger with Amazon. Uh, uh, so, Whole Foods is has merged with Amazon. Is that a? Um, are you excited about that? And should consumers be excited about it? I'm super excited about it. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a brief story, and and I, I know that some people will will be cynical about what I'm about to say, but I honestly believe it's a good metaphor for it. So we were Whole Foods being harassed by shareholder activists who were trying to take over our board, and they had an anti campaign against me in the media, and they were doing other things which I had more time and off the record. I'll someday tell you about. Uh, but they were putting a lot of pressure on our company to go up for sale. And we didn't really want to sell it necessarily, but if we, if we were going to be forced into a sale, I wanted to find absolutely the best possible partner and not just be taken over by a supermarket company that ne wouldn't necessarily share our values and our, and our views and wouldn't help us, any, to be honest. So 
kind of a mutual friend kind of introduced us. And uh, I had several execu- four, three executives fly out with me to Seattle. We met with Jeff Bezos and three of his senior executives. And, you know, if, when you've had the experience of falling in love, there, there comes a point where you have what I call the conversation, where you may stay up all night and you just have this real connection, this kind of meeting of the soul, so to speak. That happened on our first conversation. We were like thunderstruck. They were so smart and they were so authentic. And we were just like almost finishing each other's sentences by the time we left there a few hours later. And our, our executive team went to a restaurant and we were sitting around and it's like, those guys are incredible. Do you think they liked us too? <laughs> <laughs> Turned out they did. The Amazon felt the same way. What was the... And they had a whole group of executives come down four days later to Austin. And then literally six weeks after that first meeting, we'd signed merger papers. It went that fast. And we were, we were married or merged two months after that. And what was the common ground that clicked? Uh, the common ground is the, the following. Both companies are very committed to um, our most important stakeholder in both companies is customers. We're, we're about customers are our most important stakeholder and Amazon even goes beyond. They're like, they're like their top core value is they're obsessed with customers. They always care about put the customers first. And so we we synced up on that almost immediately. And then the, both companies are very innovative. Whole Foods in the food retailing business is very innovative. We're doing amazing things all the time. And Amazon, of course, admires us for that. And I don't know of a more innovative company than Amazon. They're like, what they've done and what they're doing is is great. So we were, we thought, you know, if we could get together we could reinvent You're going to have the beautiful children. Together. Yes, we're going to reinvent the supermarket business as we know it. We're going to we're going to get food to people less expensively, and also both companies are really dedicated to the long term view. But Whole Foods, having pressure from shareholder activists, we were having to focus more and more and more on the very short term quarterly to quarterly earnings. Something I swore we would never do, but I felt like maybe the company wasn't going to survive. With- Amazon's given us the freedom to think long-term again. Yeah, talk about when, when you open a store, and I realize it might change under the new arrangement, but um, you know, typically when you would open a store, how long were you thinking that that store would be there for? And what went, how much money went into a, a typical new store? Well, we sign, usually sign a 20-year lease, and then there's op- another options on that up to another 10 to 20 years on top of that. So 30 to 40 years is what we're usually thinking. With, but we're locked in usually for 20 years. So that's, you got to take the long-term view when you're, when you're investing in a store. Yeah, because this is and, to go back to the kind of uh, people who take capitalism or profit for, for uh, granted. I mean, it's always like, well, of course, you, all you have to do is put up a Whole Foods and then, you know, people start backing up Brinks trucks to you <laughs> full of money. But it's, it's a long-term, it, I mean, it's a long-term investment of, of your money at, at that point. It is, and there's no guarantee the store is going to be successful, and all of our stores haven't been successful, and you have competition that comes in and take maybe gets a better location or or opens a bigger store or undercuts you in price or it's a, it's it's very competitive out there and you you your customers they're not you don't have a gun to their heads they trade with you because it's in their interest to do so and by the way, if a better store comes along then they will desert you in droves. So you have to make a long-term commitment. You have to tie your capital up for a long, long time. I mean, you asked how much we invest in the store. It depends on the size of the store, but generally anywhere from eight to 20 plus million dollars for a new store. Um, you mentioned that you, uh, Whole Foods and Amazon have a fixation on customer, kind of satisfaction, customer experience. Do you think that in part explains the um, the, the kind of uh, attacks on both companies? And, and you know, th- I mean, there's, there's a lot going on, but it seems that the fixation on customers has got to be really threatening to firms or to businesses that have a pretty good deal going on because, you know, having to, you know, when somebody comes in and is like, I'm going to give your customers a better deal, better service, better prices, that's got to be threatening to people. I think the companies have been attacked for different reasons. I think Whole Foods is attacked because we appeal to a better educated, generally more affluent customer base. And 
because we're selling the highest quality food, it's frequently been more expensive. So some people feel like they're not invited to the party. They're not allowed to participate. And they are invited and they are welcome to participate, but they still resent it. And uh, I remember because particularly when Whole Foods started out, we were really kind of a really counterculture company. And we were as a, as one venture capitalist who didn't chose not to invest in us said, I think you guys are just a bunch of hippies selling food to other hippies and I'm not going to invest. And it turned out the hippies became yuppies and, and uh, they still shopped with us, but they started driving BMWs and now they drive Teslas and things like that. And that caused a lot of resentment from people who were a little, little less affluent and they tend to blame us. We also created very beautiful stores. So, and we, we were, it's an aspirational store. We're calling people to change their diet, to eat a higher quality food. Most people don't want to change their diet. They feel like we're judging them that we're saying something's wrong with them. We're not, but that's how they experience it. So I think those are the reasons Whole Foods is attacked. Amazon's attacked for a completely different reason. Nobody can accuse Amazon of not of having high prices because they're very, very competitive and they get, uh, they now, you know, it's two-day delivery if you're a Prime member. And, and it, I think Amazon's attacked because Amazon disrupts industries. They scare, they scare industries that are fat, and uh, comfortable, and they shake them up. Yeah, they did that with books. Uh, they're doing it. They're threatening they it with, to do it with medicine now. They did it with books. Care. They did it with music. Mm -hmm. They done it. They've done it with uh, now. You know, their video, video. Yeah. Um, now all types of retailing in general. Now with Whole Foods, they threaten food. And I, every, I can't read the paper any day where I don't read about some new business Amazon's well, going to disrupt. Here, uh, an interesting question given you're, uh, you know, you're a retail guy and Amazon is an e-commerce uh, giant. Um, is, you know, and, and e-commerce still, I mean, when you look at uh, various ways to cut it, but like, you know, it's, it accounts for maybe one out of uh, uh, one out of 10 sales, you know, in a given year, maybe, you know, 90% of commerce is still done you know, people walking into a store and walking out with something. Is retail on, you know, is traditional retail dead and, and uh, or, or is it dying? It is and, dying. Yeah. And so what, is there a way that the retail space can still flourish? And is it that it has to be more of a destination um, for the shopper, more of an experience? Or here's is it just not Here's where I think people I get asked, where are we heading? Here's where I think where we're heading. We're heading to people can get anything they want at any time they want it, anywhere they want it, at a price that they're willing to pay. And that's where we're heading. Mm -hmm. And so- That sounds like a pretty good place, It is, actually. it's a consumer <laughs> yeah. utopia. But that means a lot of established businesses are going to fail. And that's very scary. And Amazon's identified as the villain in the tail and not the villain as far as customers are concerned or consumers, they're making our lives better. but. The powers that have the economic powers that have political clout, they don't want to be disrupted, and they will go to the government and scream for protection or stop this merger or prevent this. Amazon needs to be investigated, and need to be looked into. That's all just vested economic interest trying to use the coercive power of government to protect themselves from competition. In the uh, run up to uh, election 2016, you were a big Rand Paul guy. Right. You're you know, friendly towards Gary Johnson, or at least the, the Still ideas. Am. Yep. But um, what about Trump? Do you think, uh, I guess two questions. One, are you, do you think Trump a uh, year plus in is better than Hillary would have been? And how is he not as a person? I mean, he's, a, he's exactly who we knew him to be, but from a business point of view, are things you know, is he doing good things for business? Well, sir, so kind of the joke is that there are like five things I don't want to talk about in public. I don't want to talk about religion. <laughs> I don't want to talk about politics. I don't want to talk about uh, uh, abortion. I don't want to talk about sex. And I don't want to talk about Donald Trump no. because <laughs> whatever you say, you, I'm going to get, oh, I'm going to get attacked. I'm going to get hate mail from one side and probably from both sides. So I will say that there's some things President Trump has done that I like, and there's some things I don't like. Obviously, I like those tax cuts. I think they're good for the economy and good for business. On the other hand, now we're doing tariffs on steel and aluminum. As uh, protectionism, I know that's bad for the economy, so I'm not, I'm not cheering that one on. So uh, I can't say whether Hillary would have been better or worse because we don't know. We don't get to do the controlled experiment. Um, but I can say that 
it's better when power alternates. If you've only got two parties, uh, when one power when one party stays in power too long, more bad things happen. And so, shifting around, I'm a great believer in split government where they just squabble with each other and nothing ever gets done. Because if nothing ever gets done, then nothing bad ever happens, and and people can go about their lives. So, I'm not a huge optimist about government solving our problems. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. We've been talking with John Mackey, the co-founder and CEO of Whole Foods. John, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks, Nick. For Reason, I'm Nick Gillespie.